Hi, I'm Matteo, editor of this episode of Synthesis Workshop. In today's Research Spotlight episode, we have the pleasure to have Dr. Sarah Kearney here with us. Sarah studied chemistry at the Whedon College, Illinois, and after a research experience in the National Center for Advancing Transnational Sciences, she started her doctoral studies in Florida, under the supervision of Professor Alexander Granning. During her PhD, she tackled the synthesis of actually chiral cannabinoids, which is going to be the focus of this episode. I'll leave the stage to Sara. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Matteo, for the introduction. I'm really excited about this opportunity to share the recently published work from my doctoral research in the Grenning Lab at the University of Florida. Phytocannabinoids are the chemicals found in the cannabis plant. These natural products and their synthetic analogs are being explored as alternatives to highly addictive opioid pain medications, as well as treatments for neurological disorders, inflammation, metabolic disease, and cancer. The most well-known and well-studied phytocannabinoid is tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC. THC has been the subject of numerous total synthesis efforts, as well as structure activity relationship studies since the mid 20th century. In addition, cannabidiol, or CBD, has received a great deal of attention in recent years, and there have been many synthetic routes to this natural product as well. The Grenning Lab recently proposed that axially chiral analogs of cannabinoids may serve as valuable tool compounds and potential leads in cannabinoid-based drug discovery. The philosophy guiding the conception, design, and synthesis of axially chiral cannabinoids, or ax cannabinoids, is threefold. First, ax cannabinoids are three-dimensionally biased ligands in which the ortho substitution produces rotational and dihedral angle restrictions about the biaral linkage. Second, ax cannabinoids are built upon a central biaral framework, which is a common template in pharmaceutical development. Third, Atrop isomerism in cannabinoids is unexplored and aligns with the recent call from Shenvi and coworkers for creative editing of natural products. Atrop isomerism presents both challenges and opportunities to modern drug design. We previously reported a scalable first generation synthesis of parent axially chiral cannabinol, or AXCBN, the C9 to C10 methyl transposed isomer of cannabinol, CBN, a lesser known phytocannabinoid that is essentially the product of THC oxidation. The net methyl transposition increases the ground state dihedral angle from 19 degrees in CBN to 38 degrees in AXCBN. While this initial synthetic strategy enabled gram scale access to AXCBN, two critical limitations related to a key aldol condensation step, specifically its incompatibility with substituted protonitriles and a lack of selectivity with respect to the geometry of the resultant alkene, prompted us to develop a second generation route. The second generation route needed to be able to reinstall the methyl group at C9 because substitution at this position is known to be important for activity at the cannabinoid receptors. Thus, we hypothesized that AXCBNs with both C9 and C10 substitution would be better ligands. Our retrosynthetic strategy hinged on two key steps. First, an intramolecular Diels-Alder cycloaddition of a vinyl coumarin for pargyl ether with subsequent oxidation to furnish a biaral lactone from which AXCBNs could be unveiled. The vinyl coumarin would be generated by an intramolecular vinylagous aldol condensation involving the appropriately functionalized salicyl aldehyde. The intramolecular aldol reaction would allow for total control over the geometry of the newly formed alkene, producing solely the desired Z isomer. In the forward direction, we envision that the requisite Diels Alder precursor could be assembled using known literature procedures for the preparation of dimethylpropargyl ethers and vinyl coumarins as inspiration. We elected to develop this synthetic route using commercially available 2,6-dihydroxybenzaldehyde as our starting material. We successfully constructed the model Diels Alder precursor in three steps via copper catalyzed dimethylpropargylation, DIC mediated phenol acylation with 3 free dimethyl acrylic acid, and intramolecular vanillagous aldol condensation. It was our hope that the vinyl coumarin dimethylpropargyl ether would then undergo an intramolecular thermal 4 plus 2 cycloaddition. But we found instead that the substrate selectively undergoes a propargyl phase and rearrangement, yielding an undesired pyranocoumarin product. We realized that a critical curtain hammock kinetics challenge exists in which the desired Diels Alder reaction is neither kinetically nor thermodynamically favored over propargyl phase and rearrangement. While intramolecular 4 plus 2 cycloadditions are generally favorable, in this case, the aromaticity of the coumarin must be compromised in order to achieve the transformation making it both kinetically and thermodynamically more challenging. In contrast, the propargyl Claisen rearrangement furnishes a highly conjugated and thermodynamically stable pyranocoumarin product. To overturn the innate curtain hammock reactivity, 
They postulated that a transition metal catalyst could template the diene and dienophile, enabling an alternative and more favorable mechanism for formation of the de-aromatized 1,4-cyclohexadiene product. While there are many examples of metal catalyzed 4 plus 2 cycloisomerizations, vinyl coumarins' dienes, de-aromatization, and curtain hammock kinetics challenges are novel to this research area. We hypothesized that low valent rhodium, which can react with dienes to form metallocyclopentene intermediates, which can then undergo alkyne insertion, would be ideal for our substrate. In this regard, we examined Wilkinson's catalyst in trifluoroethanol at 55 degrees. We were delighted to observe the desired 1,4-cyclohexadiene product, as well as its oxidation product. We also observed, however, the deprepargillated and propargyl clasin products. But, the addition of silver triflate, we were thrilled to observe exclusively the desired cycloisomerization oxidation product. We screened a handful of rhodium catalysts, silver salts, and solvents at different temperatures, concentrations, and reaction times, and identified the rhodium cod chloride dimer and silver triflate in trifluoroethanol at room temperature as the optimal set of conditions, leading to a combined 82% yield of the cycloaddict and its oxidation product. As a control, we performed this reaction in the absence of catalyst and confirmed that rhodium-1 is essential for the transformation. We briefly examined the scope of this reaction, most notably using the n-pentyl and 1,1-dimethyl heptyl substrates which bear the C3 aliphatic chains common to cannabinoids. Upon catalytic cycloisomerization and subsequent oxidation to the corresponding biarils, the biaryl lactones were then reduced with lithium aluminum hydride, yielding the targeted second-generation AXCVNs. During the development of the first generation synthesis of AXCBNs, former Grenning Lab member Dr. Pramali Navaratne observed a transformation that converted the Diels Alder addict into a biaryl with concomitant pyran ring cleavage. It was thought that this transformation occurred by an E1CB aromatization mechanism, wherein the nitrile group directs deprotonation, producing a carbanion intermediate that is poised to undergo pyran ring cleavage, yielding a phenoxide species. In situ or upon acidic workup, a thermodynamically favorable isomerization occurs, furnishing the biaryl product. This result was compelling as it represented a novel entry into axially chiral biarils, and the product was reminiscent of the theoretical parent axially chiral cannabidiol. The relationship between AXCBD and CBD is analogous to the relationship between THC and AXCBN. The cyclohexene ring in the natural product is exchanged for an arene, and the C9-methyl group is transposed to the C10 position, producing an axis of chirality. While parent XCBD itself is prochiral rather than chiral, due to its conformationally restricted biaryl linkage, its analogs have the potential to be axially chiral biarils. My Grenning Lab colleague, Angelo Gangano, designed a model substrate to optimize the novel E1CB aromatization reaction and determined that lithium hexamethyl disilazide in DMSO at room temperature was ideal. The reaction can be performed on the grand scale, and with our goal of preparing AXCBDs, he accessed the key cyanobiaryl intermediates, which were treated sequentially with dibol and sodium borohydride to afford the desired AXCBDs. We then determined the barrier to atrope isomerism for both AXCBNs and AXCBDs through VTNMR experiments and found that AXCBNs exhibit barriers between 14 and 17 kilocalories per mole, while AXCBDs are configurationally stable. That is, no coalescence of the enantiotopic protons was observed up to 95 degrees in deuterated toluene. These data indicate that AXCBNs are class I atropisomers, which rapidly equilibrate at room temperature and are not isoluble, while AXCBDs are class III, which are stable and separable at room temperature. Though AXCBNs can be treated as achiral due to the rapid interconversion of the individual atropisomers, they would most likely bind to their biological targets in chiral non racemic configurations. The enantiomers of AXCBDs are physically separable and would likely display distinct binding affinities at their targets. In collaboration with the laboratory of Dr. Thomas Gamage at RTI International, we were able to examine a small series of AX cannabinoids for binding affinity and functional activity at the human cannabinoid receptors CB1 and CB2. From this initial series, AXCBN3 exhibited sub-nanomolar affinity for both receptors, approximately 360-fold greater than CBN at CB1 and 134-fold greater at CB2. When compared to the dimethyl heptyl analog of CBN, reported by Re and coworkers, AXCBN3 has approximately 5 to 10-fold higher affinity 
suggesting that the addition of the C10 functional group, which biases the biaryl to a non-planar conformation, confers additional beneficial interactions with the cannabinoid receptors. Notably, AXCBN3 displayed affinity similar to that of the positive control, a potent synthetic cannabinoid called CP55940, at both receptors. AXCBN4 demonstrated 6.2-fold selectivity for CB2 over CB1, which is significant because activation of the CB2 receptor is not associated with the intoxicative effects of cannabinoids. In addition, racemic AXCBD2 displayed 4.8-fold selectivity for CB2. Importantly, AXCBN3 and 4, as well as racemic AXCBD2, also maintain functional activity at the cannabinoid receptors. For a summary of this data, as well as a more thorough overview of all the molecular pharmacology related to axe cannabinoids, please check out our publication. To better understand the impact of axial chirality on cannabinoid receptor affinity, the enantiomers of AXCBD2 were separated and evaluated. Enantiomer B exhibited 2.3-fold greater affinity at CB2 compared to enantiomer A, while there was no significant difference in affinity at CB1. For enantiomer B, this corresponds to a 17-fold selectivity for CB2, which is directly linked to the axial chirality element of the scaffold. In collaboration with the Cunningham Laboratory at Concordia University Wisconsin School of Pharmacy, induced fit docking studies were used to predict how ax cannabinoids engage CB1 and CB2. These studies revealed that in the predicted binding pose of racemic ax CBD2 at CB1, multiple steric clashes contribute to a lower glide score consistent with the lower binding affinity observed in the molecular pharmacology studies. Within CB2, however, the 10-hydroxymethyl group of racemic AXCBD2 donates a hydrogen bond to the backbone carbonyl of a leucine residue, and the phenol forms a beneficial hydrogen bond with serine. These additional beneficial binding interactions may explain the observation that racemic AXCBD2 is CB2 selective. This may also explain the difference in binding affinities between the two resolved HRF isomers. The opposite HRF isomer is unable to engage in this hydrogen bonding interaction and would therefore be expected to have a lower affinity. Unlike AXCBD2, which is configurationally stable, AXCBN3 is rapidly interconverting between its two HRF isomers. However, it's common for class 1 HRF isomers to bind their targets HRF selectively. In the predicted binding pose, the 10-hydroxymethyl group of AXCBN3 is predicted to form an intramolecular hydrogen bond with the nearby C1 phenol. This may contribute to target binding by overall lowering the hydrophilicity of this region, allowing this group to occupy an otherwise hydrophobic portion of the binding site and enhancing overall binding affinity. In canonical classical cannabinoid binding, a free phenol at C1 is generally required for binding, but for AXCBN3, this was not predicted to form beneficial interactions at CB1. At CB2, however, the C1 phenol donates a hydrogen bond to a nearby serine residue. Once again, for more details, please take a look at our article and supporting information. Together, the preliminary molecular pharmacology and molecular modeling data showcase that axe cannabinoids can mimic or even surpass the activity of natural and synthetic cannabinoids at the cannabinoid receptors. In summary, we have conceptualized and validated axially chiral cannabinoids as promising new starting points for cannabinoid-inspired drug discovery. We believe that ax cannabinoids will be uniquely valuable scaffolds due to their three-dimensionality and stability imparted by the central axially chiral biaryl framework. We have developed three distinct synthetic strategies capable of producing diverse analogs bearing either a tricyclic cannabidiol framework or a bicyclic scaffold inspired by cannabidiol. The initial structure activity relationship study revealed an axe cannabinoid with picomolar affinity for the CB1 and CB2 receptors, as well as others with greater than five-fold selectivity for CB2 over CB1. Based on these findings, the Grenning Lab plans to further interrogate the biological activity and therapeutic potential of the initial lead molecules and leverage their findings to design and synthesize the next generation of axe cannabinoids. I'd like to thank my incredibly supportive graduate advisor, Professor Alex Grenning, for giving me the opportunity to work on this project and for his dedication to teaching organic chemistry with an unparalleled level of enthusiasm. Special thanks to Dr. Pramali Navaratne for spearheading the Axe Cannabinoid Research Program and to Anjulo Gangano for being an absolute joy to work with on this project. I'm grateful to all members of the Grenning Lab, past and present, for sharing their knowledge, humor, and kindness with me day in and day out. Another big thank you to our collaborators, Dr. Thomas Gamage and Professor Chris Cunningham and their team members.
Thanks again to Matt for the invitation to present my research on Synthesis Workshop. It was a pleasure and a privilege to share on this platform. Thanks for watching this episode, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions about my presentation and beyond. I'm always glad to connect with new people to talk chemistry, drug discovery, and science communication. Thank you, Sarah, for this interesting spotlight on your PhD work. And thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, you can support our podcast by subscribing to our YouTube channel or Twitter page. And feel free to drop any comments or suggestions. Thanks again for watching and see you next time.